Imagine being bound by invisible chains every time you reach for your front door, your heart racing at the thought of stepping outside, or going to the store, or crossing bridges, or being in an elevator. Terrifying thoughts of having a medical emergency might keep you indoors, or when you do leave the house, you're white knuckling like terrified, but using every ounce of your willpower to get through activities that the average person would do without thinking. This is a daily reality for the approximately 5 million Americans living with agoraphobia. In this video, we're gonna talk about agoraphobia, some common misconceptions, and what kind of treatment works. By the end of the video, you'll learn five steps to overcoming agoraphobia, and you'll hear from someone who did it. First, a lot of people think that agoraphobia is fear of leaving the house, or fear of bridges or crowded places. And at first glance, that's what it looks like. People with agoraphobia either avoid going to these places or they still go out, but the whole time they're full of anxiety, just terrified, but forcing themselves to get out. But here's the thing, the more that I listen to the experiences of people with agoraphobia, it's not the places that scare them. It's not the mall or the bridge or the elevator. Drillin Slada, a former agoraphobia sufferer and host of the Anxious Truth podcast said, All right, so you're not afraid to leave your house or go into the open spaces. You're afraid of what will happen if you leave the house. So it's not the outdoors. It's not the supermarket. It's not the highway. It's not the school. It's not your office. It's not your school. It's not a hospital. It's none of those places. It's how you are afraid you might feel when you go into those places. They're afraid they'll have a panic attack. They're afraid they'll have anxious feelings, pass out, and they won't be able to deal with it. They're afraid they'll vomit or soil themselves and they won't be able to manage the embarrassment. They're afraid that a panic or anxiety attack is actually a medical emergency. And if they aren't with someone who will keep them safe, they won't be able to handle it. So agoraphobia is actually intense fear of becoming overwhelmed, anxious, or having physical sensations and not being able to escape or get help. And so... We're already jumping into understanding agoraphobia because in order to control something that you can't control, which is your feelings and your sensations, you start avoiding situations. Now, if we take a look at the anxiety cycle, we learn that when you avoid something, it teaches your brain that what you avoided is actually dangerous and that increases your anxiety. And then your world shrinks. Soon you can't cross that bridge or go to that store or drive by yourself anymore. And as you continue to avoid these situations, not only does your world shrink, but your anxiety actually grows. Some people with agoraphobia can't even leave a room in their house or their bed or their couch. And it's, it's not that you truly can't do those things. Physically, you can. It's that you've created a mental rule, a rule that says, if these things make me feel dangerous, then it must be dangerous. So I have to avoid them. The more you try to prevent yourself from feeling anxious, the more you try to control your anxiety, the stronger agoraphobia becomes. Now, this is really important. The key to overcoming agoraphobia is understanding the difference between a trigger and a cause. So the trigger might be a sensation of anxiety in your body, like racing hard or rapid breathing, or it's a thought like, oh, what if I have a panic attack? That can be triggered by your sensations or by a place that you believe is unsafe, like a bridge. So this is kind of what starts off that initial feeling of fear or anxiety. But the cause is how we respond to those feelings. Agoraphobia is caused by something that we do that feeds a cycle of avoidance, which leads to more anxiety. So there are two behaviors that cause agoraphobia, trying to control and trying to avoid. Trying to control sounds like cannot allow myself to go to my kid's concert because I cannot allow myself to panic. I cannot allow myself to have panic symptoms. So controlling might look like carefully arranging your schedule to avoid certain situations or making sure someone comes with you when you go out to control for an emergency. It's this like mental rule which says, oh, I have to control my panic attacks. And this rule feels safer in the short term, but your brain is going to increase anxiety in the long run. Okay, so the second cause of agoraphobia is trying to avoid. So you might say something like, oh, I once had a panic attack at the mall. That was horrible. I never want to have that again, so I can never go to the mall again. But if you don't have the skills to manage panic attacks, you're just avoiding them, then you're likely to have another panic attack at the grocery store or driving. 
And if your only skill is to just avoid more, then the number of places where you feel safe from panic is just going to shrink. Both of these responses, controlling and avoiding, send a message to your brain that these feelings or sensations are actually dangerous. And so that increases our anxiety levels. What feels good in the short term, what feels safe, which is retreating to a smaller and smaller areas, your neighborhood, your home, your bed, that's what feels safe, but it's actually what causes the symptoms of agoraphobia. It's not actually the anxiety, it's your response to the anxiety that causes agoraphobia. So Drew Linz Lauda from the podcast, The Anxious Truth says, what's happening is that your brain made a faulty connection. It thought that feeling uncomfortable meant that you were in danger. And you went along with it. You agreed with it. You left that situation. And that rewarded your brain, which strengthened your fear. Now, there are a bunch of anxious thoughts that contribute to agoraphobia. Uh, believing things like, oh, if I feel anxious, it's going to be a disaster. Or I can only go out if I don't feel anxious. Or surely the worst, most awfulest thing is going to happen, which is catastrophizing or believing everyone is looking at me, everyone is judging me, and no one will help me if I need help. Or it would be terrible if I had a panic attack. I have to guarantee that I won't have one. Um, another belief is the belief that panic attacks are actually dangerous. People often believe that they're having a heart attack or a stroke when they're actually just having extreme anxiety symptoms. And Panic attacks are actually safe. They aren't dangerous. You could check out my playlist on panic attacks to learn more about them. But fundamentally, the belief that feeling anxiety is dangerous or bad, that is the fundamental thought that fuels agoraphobia. Because if your only option is to avoid things that are dangerous or bad, then you get stuck in a cycle and it makes agoraphobia much louder. Hey everyone, if you'd like to learn more skills to improve your mental health, please check out my courses at therapyinanutshell.com. By June 10th of 2024, we're going to have all the courses available in a membership so that more people can access it every day and get the skills that they need to improve their mental health. So check that out. It's at therapyinanutshell.com. Okay, back to the video. So we often get stuck in a loop of trying to control our thinking first. We think, oh, if I can only think my way out of this, if I, I can only convince myself that I'm safe, if I can only change how I think, that'll solve it. But that gets us stuck in a loop of trying to control our thinking first and then hoping that changes how we feel so that we can leave the house because I won't feel anxious anymore. So you might think, oh, I'll leave the house when I don't feel so anxious. This does not work. We cannot think our way out of agoraphobia. Stop trying. <laughs> the only way, that's another form of avoidance, right? You're just trying to make your anxiety go away first so that you can leave. That's sticking with your old rules. The only way out of this is to reprogram your brain, to show it that the things that feel uncomfortable, aren't actually dangerous. And the way to show your brain this is through experiences. It's by getting out there. So we have to do something uncomfortable and sit with it, not retreat, not avoid, not control. And when you do that, your brain will learn by experience that you are safe, even when you're having big, loud feelings. And you can do this really gently. And, and that takes us to the treatment approach that helps people overcome agoraphobia. It's called exposure therapy. Now, stay with me here. Usually the thought of exposure therapy makes people feel really anxious because it sounds really overwhelming. But there's a way to do this really gently. Now, recently I made a video about me using exposure therapy on myself and my fear of falling. And the biggest holdup that most people have, which is myself included, is that you immediately think of the scary scariest scenario. And then you imagine that's where you have to start with exposure therapy, you, that you have to jump into the deep end of that fear right at the beginning. And, and you don't. Like, you'll learn with exposure therapy how to swim in the kiddie pool first. So as I described in my other video, I was avoiding learning how to lead climb because I was afraid of taking large falls. And I was avoiding learning how to take large falls because the only thing I could think of was these really big 10, 15 foot falls. Um, but with my fear of falling, I started by taking two inch falls on a rope, very safe falls, and then six inch falls, again, very safe falls, and then one foot falls. And each time I just grew less scared and more proud of myself. And eventually I was taking 10 or 15 foot falls and I got more and more comfortable with it. Like my fear levels like went down. So with agoraphobia, it's similar. The entire goal of exposure therapy isn't just to do scary stuff. It's to actually change your relationship with discomfort. We avoid anxiety because it's uncomfortable. 
But again, anxiety isn't dangerous. So we're going to practice in tiny doses how to stop avoiding that discomfort. So let's talk about the five steps to overcoming agoraphobia. The first step is to just get really clear on why this matters to you. What do you really want your life to be like? Who would you connect with if you didn't let anxiety control you? Where would you go? What would your day be like? So pause this video and write this down or comment below because what's more important than decreasing anxiety is actually moving in the direction of the life that you care about. How will you feel about yourself when you overcome these fears? Write it down. Okay, so number two, now that you know the why, the next step is to create an exposure hierarchy. So it's to write down a list of a bunch of things that are scary for you and then rank them on a scale uh, from zero to 10 for how much anxiety you feel. And it's really important to spend the time to come up with a bunch of things that are a two, a three, or a four on the scale because that's where we start. So um, that might include little things like leaving your bed or spending five minutes in the kitchen or sitting on your front porch or walking to the end of your driveway or around the block. Uh, you make your list and you find out what are the two to fours on your list. Okay, and then the third step is to do some gentle exposures. Now, Drew said that for him, one of his first steps was to leave the bed and spend five minutes in the kitchen. He said, you sit in the kitchen and you allow all that anxiety to happen without trying to stop it. It takes courage and when you don't run, you go toward the things you fear. You're, you're feeding the fear center in your brain positive experiences. You have a panic attack, but nothing bad happens. I tolerated this, I didn't give into it, and I was okay. And you do this over and over again and the message starts to sink in. You're feeding your brain the experiences it needs to rewire itself, to learn that it's safe to go out. And you have to have a new relationship with discomfort. You need to break your fear connection, fear of the sensations in your own body. So start small, get ready to go out. Maybe you'll have a panic attack while putting your shoes on. Learn to put your shoes on while having a panic attack. Just keep going, stick with it. It's not dangerous. And you can do this with any situation that you would normally avoid or control. And that might be being home alone, leaving a room, or needing someone to go with you. Now, you might think, oh my gosh, I have so many things that I'm scared of that I'm gonna be doing exposures forever. But you only have to overcome one fear, fear of anxiety and the sensations that go with it. Now, Drew said, I may have a panic attack tomorrow, but I will never be agoraphobic again because I'm not afraid of my panic attack anymore. Not only will you get better at feeling and get really good at feeling some anxiety without avoiding or controlling, but over time, your anxiety will go down because your brain's going to rewire. It's going to learn that feeling anxious is not dangerous. Okay. Now, the four steps important. You're going to practice ex each exposure step repeatedly until your confidence goes down before moving up to the next step. So this process is known as habituation, and this is how we break the anxiety cycle. Each time you face your fears and you don't die, <laughs> your brain learns, phew, that was actually safe. I felt anxious, but all those sensations didn't injure me. Or like, oh, I drove on the highway and everything was fine. And your brain decreases your anxiety because it learns that you are totally capable of having feelings and being okay. Uh, you're a good driver or you're you're safe out of the mall or whatever it is. And over time, you're gonna feel more comfortable in those situations. Now, when I was doing exposure therapy on myself with falling, I would, I would make myself go to the gym and take 10 falls every single time I went to the gym. And almost every single time on the first fall and the second fall, I felt very anxious. The third fall and fourth fall, I felt kind of anxious. But by the fifth fall, I was like, oh, okay, whatever, this is boring. I'm just taking a fall, I'm just taking a fall. And it got, it got quite boring. So if I had just taken one fall and then stopped, my anxiety would have just stayed the same level. It's really important that you repeat your exposures over and over again, and that's how your brain learns that you can handle it. Okay, number five, uh, stay consistent with your exposures. So it's normal to experience some anxiety during exposures, but it should be manageable and it should decrease over time with repeated practice. And then it's just really important that you celebrate and share your accomplishments. Tell people about them, celebrate them, give yourself a little reward, or keep a journal or a log so that you can notice your progress. Okay, and then as we're talking about exposure therapy, it's important to remember um, there are two pitfalls, two things that can interfere with exposure therapy working. Um, the first one is it's just really important that as you do exposure therapy, you don't get too focused on your feelings. Like the purpose of exposure therapy truly is to get you out the door and get you back into life. 
And if instead you're just constantly like, did I feel anxious or not? Did I feel anxious? What if I feel anxious? Why am I still having panic attacks, right? If you're just focused on your feelings, that's something you don't have a lot of control over. Um, it's more important to focus on our actions and our values. So you say like, oh, I care about visiting my grandkids. Did I visit them? Yes. Okay, it was successful, even if I felt some anxiety. Um, I want to take care of my yard. Did I go out in the front yard today? Yes. Even if I felt some anxiety or even if I had a panic attack, it's okay. I did the thing I was supposed to do. You just put in your energy and your focus um, toward what you really care about, what you can act on, and not just your feelings. Now, exposure therapy is really effective when done correctly, but there are some things called safety behaviors that can stop us from truly overcoming our fears like agoraphobia. So these are things like making sure you always have a family member with you or that you always have someone on the phone or using benzodiazepines or alcohol or drugs. These, these safety behaviors are part of the control that we talked about earlier, and they end up contributing to agoraphobia. So if you use a safety behavior while doing an exposure, it tells your brain, the only reason I could handle that was because I had Bob with me. This reaffirms to your brain that you're not actually capable. You're not actually safe. So your brain keeps your anxiety levels high. So do your best to let go of control and in instead make space for your feelings. Uh, this is how you'll discover your true sense of strength. It's okay to use a support person in the initial stages of exposure therapy, but just like don't, don't rely on them forever. Okay. In addition to doing work on your own, it can be really beneficial to work with someone in therapy who's really skilled in exposure therapy. I can help you overcome agoraphobia. And um, antidepressants like Prozac and Zoloft can also be helpful. So you can work with your doctor to explore your options. Um, benzodiazepines can make you feel less anxious in the moment, but they won't help you develop the skills to manage agoraphobia in the long run. And they can also increase anxiety in the long run. And as always, anything you can do to improve your general mental health can help. So this is like reducing your overall stress and anxiety, um, adding in lifestyle changes like exercise, nutrition, and self-care, and, and social support, like good connecting experiences can all help you feel healthier and overcome agoraphobia. So that's agoraphobia in a nutshell. Um, you really can learn to stop letting fear and panic and anxiety run your life. And little by little, you can show your brain that you can feel the fear and do it anyway. And in the long run, your brain will learn that it doesn't need to give you so much anxiety after all. Okay, I hope this was helpful. Thanks for watching and uh, take care. Oh, also, if you'd like to learn more about panic attacks and agoraphobia, like check out the links in the, uh, to more videos in the description. Okay, have a good one.